Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to echo Riyadh's words, and um, it was a great pleasure to meet uh, so many of you this Sunday and to be able to interact with you. Um, one of the things we could have had a little more is to be able to have more time to free time to talk to each other and to, you know, mingle. Uh, but we also wanted to have, you know, your participation as well. Um, thank you for those who came out, and I hope that they, um, it was useful and wonderful for them. Uh, we are talking tonight about um, superstitions uh, in Islam, uh, and Islam, sorry. Now, all of us know that when, you know, when you were going to school, we used to study um, different cultures of people. And you will see in every culture, there are certain practices that each culture has. And when Islam came, it also met the culture of the Arabs because it came to the Arabs firstly, and then it got spread to different parts of the world. So when it came to Indonesia, it met the Indonesian culture. When it came to Malaysia, it met the Malaysian culture. When it went to Africa it, and the different countries there, it also met those different cultures. And so there is always this issue of how do you navigate Islam and your culture? And essentially, Islam came and it does not indicate to us that because you accept Islam, you ought to give up your whole culture. In fact, what it does, it asks you to keep your culture because that's who you are, that's your personality, that's how you grow up, that's your environment. And it creates certain principles that allow you to take from your culture that which is within accordance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to identify those aspects of your culture which are not considered um, legal and lawful according to Allah. So we are asked to look at our cultures and just take away, don't continue to practice those things which Allah has deemed haram or uh, unlawful. And I want to, before I get into the, the, the topic, is also to mention that human beings generally have been created with a nature to worship. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creating us has made our very nature indicating our fitra that we have the desire to worship something. And if you don't worship Allah, you end up worshiping something because human beings um, desire to worship. And so throughout the ages, humanity have always developed in their cultures to look to some higher power for help, to look for some place. And I want you to understand that when we look at other cultures, we should never ever, and we are warned and taught, taught not to belittle other people's cultures. Because uh, to us it may look silly, uh, but the reality is for those people involved in that culture, this is a very important aspect of their civilization. So we are never asked to criticize and condemn because they can also look at us as Muslims and say we are also crazy because we bow our heads down five times a day to we can't see any any person you're bowing down to, you know, and we are hoping that this has some kind of result. Or we're raising our hands in the air and speaking words in Arabic and English uh, to something which is like in the ether. So they will can look at us and say we're also crazy and that we have a weird kind of behaviors. So it is important that we understand that. Um, so let's look at what can be discussed or defined as um, a superstition. So it is really a, a belief that is held by a set of people um, in some supernatural uh, cause and that by believing in this supernatural cause, you know, they are able to solicit from that cause benefit or harm. And so they they go to this uh, place 
And they believe that if they do certain practices and certain rituals, that it will benefit them. Or you may do a ritual that designed to harm someone else, your enemies and so on. Uh, and so it's a belief that is based on unknown. So people manifest that in various physical forms. You know, they, they believe that, you know, um, if you have like a, talismans and you have um, they believe in you know they, it gets manifested in many different ways and so um, you see there their practices they would use these different gadgets and these different amulets and talismans and, and, and so on and then they would have people in that community or that culture that would be like a specialist at telling the fortune telling or you, you, you have some problem with an individual that they may have some weird behavior. They would go to these, um, what they call them. Um, in each culture, they would have one of these people that you go to. That would be known as the the, the healer or the, the shaman, whatever the show. <clears throat> and so, um, the it is important to understand. So this also existed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he came to the Arabs. And first you want to talk about us. Now, we, as we navigate our cultures and all the different beliefs we have, um, we have to have some way of how can we assess as Muslims which one is good and which one is bad. And so we need to, on a very basic level, be able to have enough information to know whether these things really are true or not. In my country, Guyana, we have so much of different kinds of, of superstition. You know, like you don't handle money at night. You can't, I mean, there's so many things that um, this belongs to the culture in terms of these beliefs. Uh, and so, first of all, let us look at some of the important principles that we need to understand uh, in relation to assessing whether something is a superstition in a culture that, or a practice in a culture that we can either accept or reject. So the first and very important principle is that any Islam divides the teachings of Islam into two groups. One is called worship. So those are actions of worship and then they are actions of non-worship. So you have two broad categories in Islam. So you have those which are the formalized worship, and these are usually the five pillars of Islam, Salah, Zakah, Saum, Hajj. And then you have actions which are not deemed to be worship. Like, for example, I, I eat a mango, or, or I marry someone, or I go to the marketplace, or, you know, these are acts which are considered non-worship. I talk on my phone and all of that. So there is a principle regarding each of these. For actions which are worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to protect that because our worship to him cannot be we just guessing how to worship to Allah. So Allah has defined for us exactly how we must worship him. And so anything that we put out or we act on that says it's worship, we have to have a proof for it. You have to have an evidence for it or else we cannot accept it. So in our religion, every act of worship must have a proof. You must have an evidence to support that. Sallu kamara aytamuni usalli. The Prophet says, pray as you see me pray. So the evidence for praying is you watch the companions, watch the Prophet pray, and they followed exactly what he did. Right? So fasting, you have to have a proof for it. Before you do anything, I cannot wake up tomorrow and says I'm going to make four rakah maghrib salah, or you know, not that is not allowed. Or I can say, you know, four time praying at five times a day prayer is too much. I'm going to reduce it to three. Anything you do like that in worship, you have to have a proof. And if you don't have a proof, it's rejected. In relation to non worship, everything is accepted unless you have a prohibition. Unless you have something prohibiting it, then it is considered allowed. 
In worship, everything is rejected unless you have a proof. In non-worship, everything is accepted unless you have a prohibition. So that is why I can drink a coconut water. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi never drink coconut water. But why is it allowed? Because we don't have a prohibition for it. And so this is a principle that we have to be very care careful about and understand well. Why we don't eat pork? It's a non-worship area. There is a prohibition for it. That's why we don't do it. So anytime someone asks you a question in Islam about any matter, your first thing has to be, which category is it in? First thing you have to distinguish when someone asks you a question about Islam or you're trying to do something, I have to put it in the proper category. Is it a worship issue or is it a non-worship issue? And then I have my rule and my principle. If I don't have anything prohibiting it, it's allowed. And so on. I've took, taken a little while to explain this because I really want us to get this. And we have done it in the past classes as well. So that's the first very important principle. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also ordains what will happen to us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined how we will live. He knows what is going to happen to us. And, and so Allah is the one that protects us and our future is defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, no one has absolute knowledge of the future. This is a very important, anyone claiming to have absolute knowledge of the future is lying. <clears throat> so the, the people who are the psychics and the ones who, the fortune tellers and the ones who said they're reading the stars and they're telling us about our future, anyone who claims that they could tell us what will happen to us in the future, that person or that entity is a fraud. Because we are taught in our faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give that power to anyone to, de to know what will happen exactly in the future. You may make guests based on statistics or past experiences. You may make a, a guess that says, you know, it's likely we are in this season that maybe rain is going to fall tomorrow because for the whole week rain fell. I predict rain is going to fall tomorrow, you know, as the weather people try to forecast. But no one has absolute knowledge of this, of exactly what will happen. Uh, and Allah says, say, I do not have the treasures of Allah, nor do I know the unseen, nor do I tell you that I'm an angel. I only follow what is revealed to me. Say, is a blind, is a blind person like one who can see? Why will you not reflect? And so Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu to say, tell them that he doesn't have, him, he, who is the messenger of Allah, don't have the knowledge of the future. Say, Prophet, I have no control over benefit or harm even to myself, except as Allah may please. If I had knowledge of what is hidden, I would have abundant good news and no harm could touch me. I am no more than a bearer of warning and a good news for those who believe. And so this is a first very important principle, uh, one of the very important principles in terms of um, knowing if we can accept superstitious belief or not. Anyone claiming to know the future, they are ruled out. And then we have, um, we need to know that there are some beliefs in Islam that looks kind of weird and looks very like superstitious belief, but they are accepted as real. Uh, and so when we see those, we have to accept them. One of it is evil eye. We don't exactly, it's usually people who have envy and they, they and when they, they, they stare you down with, with this hatred, it can manifest itself and cause problems for you. We don't exactly know the nature of how this evil eye works, but it is um, testified in the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu indicated to us that this is a, a real thing. So we accept that because we accept Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's Quran and the Prophet as being from Allah. And so there are things sometimes which our intelligence cannot really understand well, but we are asked to believe in them as being truth. 
So verily those who disbelieve would almost make you slip with their eyes through hatred. And um, Ibn Abbas said this is the, the evil eye. And the evil eye is real. And if anything were to overtake the, defined, the, the design decree, it would be the evil eye. When you are asked to take a bath to provide a cure from the influence of the evil eye, you should take a bath. So this evil eye has been something that is real. It is in many cultures. Even I think the dollar bill has an eye on it. Um, the Freemasons have an eye. In Christianity, they have verses for the Bible that talks about evil eye. So evil eye has been around and has been accepted as something that can affect us as human beings. <clears throat> Uh, in relation to whether we can be possessed by a jinn, this is also considered uh, part of our belief in Islam, that all the scholars are in agreement that the, a jinn can possess a human. Those, there's an ayah, you know, um, those who eat uh, riba uh, will not stand on the day except like standing, just standing, like the standing of a person beaten by shaitan, leading him to insanity. And so and the prophet mentioned shaitan flows in the son of Adam, like blood flows. So and shaitan is from the jinn. So uh, we believe that a, a jinn can, which is a, and the jinn is another kind of creation. They were created out of fire. We cannot see them, but they exist like angels. And they live among us. They live on the earth. They have some of them believe and some disbelieve. And they are a different kind of people. And so uh, we believe that they can affect human beings. Uh, and a lot of time it's, I mean, I think we've done a class on jinn. Um, like a jinn may fall in love with a person, for example, and infect them. Or a jinn, you may accidentally harm a jinn without knowing it. And they will seek revenge and possess you and so on. We don't want to go off too much into it, but um, I think we did one of the classes on it. So if you hear someone being possessed by a jinn, we, we should take it seriously and um, explore and send them to the relevant expert to see if it is really the case. Because 90% of the time when the people say they have jinns, it is really not so. It's just people playing tricks and for one reason or another. Um, the Quran, when it mentions superstitious beliefs and ideas, it always mentions it as coming from the enemies of the messengers of Allah. And for us, you, we see an evil omen from you. And if you cease not, we will surely stone you and a painful torment will touch you from us. This is what they tell the messengers of Allah. They're always telling them that an evil will come to them. You know, Allah tells us about the people of Pharaoh. Pharaoh and says, and whenever good come to them, they said, Oh, this is ours. And when evil afflicted them, they, they said this evil came from Moses, from Musa salam, and those who were with him. So the enemies of Allah has always been uh, accusing the believers of being the one that brings superstitious omens and different kinds of um, wicked belief to, to them. And so... <clears throat> These are some of the, the ways in which we can be able to know and distinguish um, and use to, to gauge and to test superstitious belief that exists. Now, there are some beliefs in Islam. Another one which we didn't have here, which was Seher, which is like magic, also exists. As you know, in Fir'aun, when Fir Moses was there, they have people can cast... Um, evil omens in you as well. Um, in our religion, there are certain beliefs that we have to make sure we are clear about. Number one, to regard someone other than Allah that they can bestow honor or disgrace, adversity or prosperity or gain or loss is an un-Islamic belief. We do not believe that anyone other than Allah is in charge of this. It is Allah who can do this for us. Not, O Lord, 
oh, say, O oh Allah, owner of the sovereignty, you grant sovereignty to whom you will, you strip it from whom you will, you honor whom you will, you humiliate whom you will. In your hand is all goodness and you are capable of all things. And so for us, anything that uh, we, we seek help, we go to Allah first. That's what the first chapter of the Quran, Yaka Na'budu wa Yaka Nasta'in. The alone do we worship and the alone do we ask for help. So anytime you find you are afflicted by anything, we must always first turn to Allah. This is a very important Islamic belief. Not the Obia man, not the, you know, the people who we think can help us. We always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Because we believe that only Allah can really change your condition. Even you go to a doctor, what did this doctor do? The doctor doesn't really heal you. The doctor creates an environment in which Allah has to heal you. You know, but the doctor really don't heal you. The doctor give you medicine. The doctor see from past experiences that when you take this medicine, you have a likelihood of being healed, but there's no guarantee. It, you have to now sit and wait for Allah to, to heal that body and to take over. So Allah is always the one that does that. Secondly, we are asked to always only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only worry about Allah. Put our trust in Allah and not in anyone else. All right. So if we feel confident in someone else other than Allah, um, that is not an Islamic belief. So the believer always first and foremost put their trust in Allah. No matter what happens to them. It looks really bad as we saw, like, for example, the people of Palestine in Gaza. You know, you would think that what is happening to them, that they would give up on Allah. You know, they would say, wow, I'm praying to Allah five times a day. And what is what is he doing to us? What is he causing to happen to us? We barely know if we're going to live for the next hour. But they believe and put their trust in Allah. Because this is part and parcel of who being Muslim is. Believers are those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful. And when the verses are recited, it increases them in faith. And they rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing that is important to know is that kissing graves or standing upon them, touching them. If you think that this will have a benefit for you then this is an un-Islamic belief. All right? So we are not allowed to think that somehow the dead will come back to help us or the, you know, doing something by the grave and prostrating yourself and so on. And a lot of people do. Um, you know, this is not an Islamic belief. And so we do not do that. Um, keeping a picture of a saint or some famous person or some you know righteous person and revering them and you know putting flowers over the picture and thinking that if we pray through this saint somehow we will be better no we are a religion that you speak directly to allah we don't speak through the prophet we don't speak through saints we go directly and ask from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do not believe that if you just try to um, adore the saint, that somehow your situation will get better. Allah mentions to us many times, If you ask of Allah, ask, ask of Allah. And if you seek assistance, seek assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this is another practice that we must not indulge in. And then to practice someone something from one's culture that is not approved by Islam. You know, and we see this showing up a lot of times at weddings. There's so much cultural practice that we see happening that um, that is not condoned or, or actually promoted by Islam. Um, it's a cultural thing. And if any one of those cultural things are against the religion, we should not partake of them. If they are not against anything in Islam, then that's fine. A lot of times I do weddings 
and I will allow the people to bring their cultural, they will tell me, well, we want to do this, we want to do that. If you go to a wedding of a Muslim and you go to one in Morocco, you go to one in Saudi Arabia, you go to one in Africa, they're all different because they all bring cultural expressions to them. I mean, you will see if you do a wedding from Bangladesh or or, or from India, they would have like this uh, barrier of flowers between the groom and the bride. And, and so each culture have this different way of expressing how they want to do that within the principles. For us, we have to make sure always the principles are established. And as long as the culture does not ask us to get away from one of those, then it is fine. But you must always ask and don't. And whenever you are told that this particular cultural practice of yours is against Islam, you have to stop it. You have to stop, continue doing it. You cannot continue practicing that if you learn, you know, like having 40 day work, for example, on the 40th day when someone died to have a function and a program and so on. This, there's no evidence for this. And so this is a cultural thing. And so if you find yourself doing that and someone says this is not a practice of the Prophet Wasallam, then you should not do it. Um, also to believe that whatever you dream, it's binding on you. This is not correct. right? The prophets of Allah, their dreams, they have a special situation. Their dreams are always true and they know. That's why Ibrahim a.s. When he dreamed that he had to sacrifice his son, he knew this is from Allah because the prophets get true dream. For us, our dreams are a combination of three things. We can get a truthful dream or we can get a dream that is made up of all the activities during the day that we have. It, it becomes mishmashed and it becomes a, a dream that we have. You know, So if you were in an accident the day before and then when you sleep at night you may get some aspect of that accident coming up in your dream um, and then you have shaitan playing with you in your dream and bringing bad dreams to you but whatever you dream even if you dream the prophet وسلم, and you dream that some you know righteous person has tell you you have to do this they are not binding in sharia that whatever we dream that it is binding on us to follow all right so, um, and then to believe in horoscopes, um, this is a superstitious belief that um, is very popular, right? Um, and then the Hindus have a system also where, you know, when you have to get married, they have to go to the pandit and then he have to figure out when is the best moment according to the stars uh, for you to get married and so on. These beliefs we don't have. We don't believe that you know you're a Leo or a Gemini or Aries and all of this, and that you have to get up every day. You used to have the newspaper. You got to go see what is my horoscope for today and all of that. Um, Prophet says, whoever learns anything of astrology has learned a branch of witchcraft, a seher. So we don't follow that because what that signifies is that someone knows our future. And we already learned from the principle that any person claiming to know the future for you is not um, is not telling the truth. To believe in psychics and fortune tellers, which we mentioned before, he is not one of us who practices augury, which is like explain homens, or has it done for him who tells fortunes or has fortunes told, or who practice witchcraft or have it done to him. We do not accept these things as being valid uh, for us as Muslims to practice people uh, pretending that they could tell your future by looking at the palm of your hands uh, or by reading tarot cards and, and predicting what is going to happen to you. So please don't waste your money going and spending uh, very expensive uh, behind that. And then uh, to wear our amulets and charms, uh, you know, the... Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, whoever wears an amulet, may Allah not fulfill his need. And whoever wears a seashell, may Allah not give him peace. So they used to wear and these different amulets as good luck charm, a rabbit's foot, and a garlic, and so many different cultures have different um, good luck charms that they attach themselves to. Um, those have no power in themselves. Only Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has the power to change your condition. 
So rather than hang on to these things as having some hidden power to help you, they don't. Just turn to Allah and talk in the language that you know and just tell him what you need. Um, there is difference of opinion among the scholars um, in regarding to having amulets with Quranic verses in it. Right? Um, and so the scholars of the standing committee, um, which is the FIC committee, said that it is haram to wear amulets that contain any other than the Quran, but they have a difference of opinion about whether putting Quran in some of these things, like we have like mini Qurans that you actually can um, hang up on on your your in your car on your riff over the rearview mirror, where you have the whole Quran in a small little um, box that some people put on their cars and so on. Uh, so there's a different difference of opinion about this issue in terms of because the Quran came as a healing also, and so that's part of the discussion that they have. Um, the if it is done, if the Quran is hang, hung up like in your houses or verses, if you're doing it with the idea of education, then that is allowed. That you know, reminded of these verses and so on. But to do it just to think that it will bring you keep away evil and bring you, you know, uh, protection from that sense, um, this is where the difference comes. And um, it is allowed for educational purposes, not for you know. Uh, thinking that it will protect you from evil. <clears throat> um, so those are some of the un-Islamic uh, beliefs that we have to also understand so that whenever any one of these superstitions come, we can categorize them and we can know very quickly whether they are okay or not. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there were some beliefs that they had. Uh, one of it was... Uh, Tiara, which is a superstitious belief in terms of birds, that they had this belief, you know, when they got to go out on a journey, there are certain birds that they used to regard that would give them good luck. Some birds would be bad if they hear a crow, you know, and the, 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 the crowing, they would say this is um, like bad luck. And they had a huge complex system of using birds for determining whether good luck or bad luck will happen to them. Or if they see a gazelle passing, it would be like a, a bad omen. If they see a camel with a heavy load, it will be a bad omen. If they see one with a light load, it's a good omen. They have many, many, many of these kinds of um, practices that they indulged in. <clears throat> and so when the Prophet Sallallahu came, he was able to establish these principles that allow them to see that None of these, you depend on Allah and Allah alone. We don't um, we don't believe in good luck, bad luck, and all of that. You just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one we turn to. And then we have, we live in America, so I wanted to capture some of the superstitious belief in our culture here. Um, one of the very famous ones and well-known one is Friday the 13th or the 13th as a whole. Um and it's there are many a lot of times if you go back and you study <clears throat> some of these beliefs where they came from, and sometimes they come from uh, Christian beliefs, sometimes they come from these uh, pagan beliefs that who used to worship the sun god, and they uh, and they, they they get passed on through the ages. So like Judas was the thirteenth guest of the Last Supper. And Jesus was crucified on Friday, so those two indicate that these two days are really bad, you know. Um, and so this, in, in a society where technology is so incredible, yet people are so, um, believe so much in this idea that the 13th is bad and that Friday is bad, that when Friday occurs on the 13th, many people don't go to work. You know, you can actually track the stock market and see that the, the doubt will be a day when the stocks will drop because people are terrified to go out on Friday the 13th. Um, airlines don't have 13th rows. I, I don't know if it's all of them, but um, and there's a lot of buildings that they, when they build them, they move from floor number 12 to floor number 14. You know, you don't have the 13th floor. 
And one of the reasons why builders do it is because nobody's going to rent the 13th floor. So why build it? So they have found that when we put a 13th floor, it's not going to be rented out. Nobody is going to want it. If we have, you know, in the hospital, the 13th floor, we're not staying there as patients. Or we're not sitting in the airline on the seat where the row number 13. Because people have this, this belief that something bad is going to happen to them. Itchy palm, for example. Um, if your palm is itching, it means good luck. They have, you know, that you're going to meet somebody new or money is going to come to you. Walking under a, a ladder, uh, it's considered bad luck because it forms a triangular shape. And uh, in some mythologies, it signifies life. But also it means that, you know, when you walk through a under a ladder with under this shape, you're tempting the fates of the, the, the spirits and um, you're awakening those spirits that, that that may harm you, the evil spirits. So usually when people walk on the ladder, they will make a sign of the cross. Um, in Christians, they believe that when they make a sign of the cross, it prevents them from evil happening to them. Um, breaking a mirror is considered bad luck. Uh, seven years of bad luck. Because it takes seven years to replace all the cells in your physical body. And so they say when a broken mirror, it's like, you know, and because the mirror, they say, reflects your soul, you kind of like harming your soul when the mirror gets broken. And to end this, you have to take the broken mirror outside and bury it in the moonlight. And as all superstition, when you're hearing it, it sounds so stupid. But it is really part of it. It is part of something that evolved through cultures, and the people who follow those cultures they really believe in it. Finding a horseshoe is considered good luck. All right, the horseshoe is like the one of the luckiest symbols that you know you have, and uh, you will see a lot of times in barns or different places they will <coughs> they will nail up a horseshoe for good luck. You know they would put it up. Um, on their buildings and so on, and, and the entrance of buildings. So as a sign of good luck. Um, one of the beliefs about it also is the number of nails left on an abundant horseshoe reveals how many years of good luck you have left coming. Opening an umbrella inside of a house or a building is considered bad luck. Um, not only it presents a risk for breaking items, poking people in the eye, it seems to offend the sun god. Usually umbrella was a sign of um, only rich people ha had owned umbrella at that time. And it was considered undignified to open it in the house as well. Um, it also implies impending death or bad, good, uh, evil, or you're losing your fortune by doing that. Knock twice on wood will reverse bad luck. And this is sometimes you will see people say knock on wood. Um, this was a superstitious belief that the gods lived in the trees. And so to ask for a favor, you would knock lightly on the tree as if to solicit them to grant you, you know, some good um, omen. And so you would knock on trees, <clears throat> tossing salt over your shoulder for good luck. You know, salt was considered a very valuable ingredient, and it's thought that it can purify your soul and ward off evil spirits. So when you sprinkle a, sign, a tiny bit of salt over your shoulder, you know, it can drive away evil spirits. Black cats was considered bad luck. In the Middle Ages, it, it was thought that the witches had kept black cats as companions, and so some people even believe that these kitties could turn into witches one day or demons. And so there was always a fear that when a black cat crossed your path, that you're going to have a bad day. You know, um, and then we have one that is still very much alive among us. It's called Halloween. <laughs> Celebrated on October the 31st. This was a tradition of the, the Celtic festival of Samhain. Um, Gregory the Pope had um, designated November the 1st as a time to honor saints. 
So that was the day that it was the, called the All Saints Day. And then in the evening of that particular tradition, All Hallows Eve, and later it became Halloween. Um, and it was believed that um, you would wear costumes and you would light fire to ward off evil spirits and ghosts that will come so they won't recognize you when they come because you are dressed up in a different garment. Uh, and it became and evolved eventually to what we know Halloween is today, trick-or-treating and carving jack-o'-lantern. Um, they have um, that uh, not so much about what its original intent was. Um, and as you mentioned, every culture has different, different ones. So there are three important ways in which we should um, deal with superstition. Number one, um, we have to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because some of those beliefs and so on, um, we protect ourselves from anything that may come. And so, as the Hadith of the Prophet said, Tiara, which is the one with the um, bird mostly, is shirk, and any one of us may think he sees an evil omen, but Allah will dispel it by means of him putting his trust in Allah. So any kind of problem we got, any test, any difficulty, the first thing we need to do is always turn to Allah and put our confidence that Allah, who is aware of what is happening to us, and asking for him to help us. First, not doubting or thinking that Allah is punishing us or that always putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, don't allow anything to prevent us from living our lives, from pursuing our agenda, from going ahead. Don't allow these things to cause us to stop doing what we're doing. All right, we should make sure that you know you go drive out from your driveway and a black cat cross your path. You say, I think I'm going out today. I'm, and you drive back home. When you begin to follow these superstitions, you make your life miserable because what you do, you bring restrictions to your life to such an extent that it becomes difficult to function. You know, you go out and you realize, oh, it's Friday the 13th. I don't think I'm going to work today. You turn back. If you go along, I'm going to have a bad day. And usually your wish comes true when you do that because you make your day bad. Because you want it to, to, you want that wish to be fulfilled. So we're not, we don't go and allow these things to affect our lifestyle and to affect the way we go about handling our day. And then we must pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any one of these things. If you get possessed by a jinn, there are people who are trained in helping to deal with this. You know, so any one of these issues that come up. We have uh, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to take us out of it, to protect us from it, to seek refuge from it. <clears throat> and it's very easy to seek refuge in Allah. All you have to say, A'uzu billah, I seek refuge in Allah. And you can say it in English, in Arabic. Before we recite the Quran, we usually say, A'uzu billahi min shaitan al rajim that I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, the rejected one, from Satan, the rejected one. Why? Because when we are about to do a good deed, we don't want shaitan to uh, be there tempting us. So when we recite the Quran or we go to do any good deed, it is useful to say, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. And to keep ourselves protected from the shaitan, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falak and Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas have been designated to us as two surahs which can protect you, both from mankind and from jinn. So usually when you leave for your day, it is good, but you're going out to drive to your car, recite Surah Al-Nas and Surah Al-Falaq, which is the last two chapters of the Quran. Before you sleep at night, you recite these two surahs because they will protect you. These surahs came to protect the Muslims from all kinds of evil. So learn these two surahs and recite them often. And you will be protected from all the, the shenanigans of the shaitan and also be protected from the harm from human beings themselves. All right. So um 
and then uh, it is narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr. The Prophet says, whoever lets Tiara stop him from doing something has committed an act of shirk. We don't allow superstition to stop. And then there's a dua here recommended that we can read also to protect us. Right? Allahumma la tayra illa tayruk wa la khayra illa khayruk wa la ilaha ghayruk. And, O oh Allah, there is no sign other than your sign, no goodness other than your goodness, and none worthy of worship other than you. So this dua will also protect you from any kind of superstitious harm that people may want to harm you with. And so, um, as Muslims, we are asked to live our lives, um, and the, the, our evidence for what we do and don't do is coming from our, our book, our sources, the Quran and the Sunnah. We don't just make up stuff. We don't just accept things from our culture because that's how we grew up. We always make sure that we have um, either an evidence for it or a prohibition against it before we go ahead. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all the kind of wickedness and difficulties that exist out there that humans do to each other and also from the wickedness of the jinns. Assalamu alaikum.